for what is Lucirigari most famous? The publication of Ira Gares, 1932, Doctoral Thesis, Speculum of the Other Woman. 1974, led to her expulsion from further study at Lakin's Freudian School at Vincennes. In Europe a PhD is not sufficient for university teaching. As it is in the United States, and a second dissertation or habilitation is required. Ira Gary's dissertation consisted of her theoretical analyses of a lecture by Sigmund Freud. 1856-1939, on femininity and long quotations from the works of male philosophers, from Plato. C-428 C-348 BCE, to Hegel, 1770-1831. It was evident in the work that by a speculum. She was referring to the concave mirrored medical instrument inserted into a woman's body. For what is Lucira Gary most famous? The publication of Ira Gares, 1932, Doctoral Thesis, Speculum of the Other Woman. 1974, led to her expulsion from further study at Lakin's Freudian School at Vincennes. In Europe a PhD is not sufficient for university teaching. As it is in the United States, and a second dissertation or habilitation is required. Ira Gary's dissertation consisted of her theoretical analyses of a lecture by Sigmund Freud. 1856-1939, on femininity and long quotations from the works of male philosophers, from Plato. C-428 C-348 BCE, to Hegel, 1770-1831. It was evident in the work that by a speculum. She was referring to the concave mirrored medical instrument inserted into a woman's body. Was Lucira Gray's speculum of the other woman socially relevant? Yes, and it has also had a tremendous influence on students and scholars of French feminist philosophy. In the context of the women's health movement in the United States during the 1970s, it expressed part of the spirit of the gynecological aspect of women's liberation. Women began to rebel about the fact that there were so few women doctors and that Male doctors treated their reproductive and childbirth issues in repressive ways. Women began to talk more openly about their feelings of shame about their own bodies. Members of some women's collectives began giving themselves and their friends gynecological examinations. And others, without prior medical training, taught themselves how to administer abortions. At the same time, the practices of natural childbirth, childbirth without medication, and nursing, which until then had been the only resort for many poor women, were advocated for privileged women, for the health of both mothers and babies. These examples of women taking responsibility for their health were motivated both by an ideology of rebellion against patriarchy and the goal of improving women's health. Since the 1970s, 
feminist advocates have pointed out that clinical medicine has traditionally been based on the male body. Some diseases have different symptoms in men and women for example, heart disease. At this time, female doctors are commonplace, particularly in the practice of gynecology. And there is greater attention, overall, to women's health problems. Historical Information on the 1970s women's health movement can be found at CWLU Her's Tory Project. The online history of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union is at http colon slash slash Was Luce Ira Gray's speculum of the other woman socially relevant? Yes, and it has also had a tremendous influence on students and scholars of French feminist philosophy. In the context of the women's health movement in the United States during the 1970s, it expressed part of the spirit of the gynecological aspect of women's liberation. Women began to rebel about the fact that there were so few women doctors and that male doctors treated their reproductive and childbirth issues in repressive ways. Women began to talk more openly about their feelings of shame about their own bodies. Members of some women's collectives began giving themselves and their friends gynecological examinations. And others, without prior medical training, taught themselves how to administer abortions. At the same time, the practices of natural childbirth, childbirth without medication, and nursing, which until then had been the only resort for many poor women, were advocated for privileged women, for the health of both mothers and babies. These examples of women taking responsibility for their health were motivated both by an ideology of rebellion against patriarchy and the goal of improving women's health. Since the 1970s, feminist advocates have pointed out that Clinical medicine has traditionally been based on the male body. Some diseases have different symptoms in men and women for example, heart disease. At this time, female doctors are commonplace, particularly in the practice of gynecology. And there is greater attention, overall, to women's health problems. Historical Information on the 1970s women's health movement can be found at CWLU Her's Tory Project. The online history of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union is at http colon slash slash www.cwluhrstory.com. Is French feminism flamboyant? At times, yes, it is. For example, Verena Andermatt Conley relates that Helen Sixus, 1937, used to enter the complex of the University of Paris at Vincennes in a dazzling ermine coat, whose capital worth most probably surpassed the means of many in the classroom. Is French feminism flamboyant?
At times, yes, it is. For example, Barona Andermatt Conley relates that Hellensixus, 1937, used to enter the complex of the University of Paris at Vincennes in a dazzling ermine coat, whose capital worth most probably surpassed the means of many in the classroom. Who is Helen Success? Helen Success, 1937, is best known to philosophers for her The Laugh of the Medusa and Sorties, both 1975. These works constitute an anti essentialist exhortation for women to reclaim their bodily experience in a new form of feminine writing, a creature feminine. Success has been interpreted to advocate bisexuality and multiplicities of sexuality in ways believed to have prefigured queer theory. Who is Helen Success? Helen Success, 1937, is best known to philosophers for her The Laugh of the Medusa and Sorties, both 1975. These works constitute an anti-essentialist exhortation for women to reclaim their bodily experience in a new form of feminine writing, a creature feminine. Success has been interpreted to advocate bisexuality and multiplicities of sexuality in ways believed to have prefigured queer theory. Why are LBGT studies and queer theory part of philosophy now? They have become part of philosophy along with an overall interest in expanding cultural studies to include attention to issues previously neglected. This change has been part of the humanities, generally. And philosophers have focused on conceptual issues related to these fields. Queer theory emerged in the 1990s, along with LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual studies, as a positive affirmation of sexual difference that does not fit into any of its predecessor categories, including lesbianism. Good overviews on the subject may be found in Naomi Shore's Feminism Meets Queer Theory. 1997, and helpful works on transsexuality are Susan Stryker's Transgender History. 2008, and Laurie Shorich's You've Changed, 2009. Why are LBGT studies and queer theory part of philosophy now? They have become part of philosophy along with an overall interest in expanding cultural studies to include attention to issues previously neglected. This change has been part of the humanities, generally. And philosophers have focused on conceptual issues related to these fields. Queer theory emerged in the 1990s, along with LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual studies, 
as a positive affirmation of sexual difference that does not fit into any of its predecessor categories, including lesbianism. Good overviews on the subject may be found in Naomi Shore's Feminism Meets Queer Theory. 1997, and helpful works on transsexuality are Susan Stryker's Transgender History. 2008, and Laurie Shorich's You've Changed, 2009. Why has there been a third wave in feminism? According to its critics, the second wave was presumed to speak for all women while it merely propounded the interests of a small group of white, privileged American intellectual women. Why has there been a third wave in feminism? According to its critics, the second wave was presumed to speak for all women while it merely propounded the interests of a small group of white, privileged American intellectual women. What is Buddhism? Buddhism was founded in India by Siddhartha Gautama. The majority of Indian scholars place his lifespan as C563 C483 BCE Indian Buddhism divided into Theravada or Hinayana or Lesser Vehicle, and Mahayana, or Greater Vehicle. Indian Buddhism was no longer a vibrant religion in India after the 13th century. But it had by then spread geographically. Theravada Buddhism is practiced in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Sri Lanka. Mahayana Buddhism is practiced in China, Japan, Nepal, and the United States. Tibetan Buddhism, in addition to including the greater and lesser vehicles, has a form known as Varayana. All of the three vehicles are practiced in Himalayan parts of Mongolia, northeastern China, and Russia. Zen Buddhism is practiced in Japan as a kind of meditation called Zazen that repudiates texts. Even though there is a written tradition, and focuses on unmediated direct experience. Zen originated in India and emerged in China in the 7th century CE. From which it spread to Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. Zen includes Yoga C.A.R.A., which is a form of philosophical idealism that uses Yoga exercises to achieve disbelief in the existence of physical objects. What are problems with functionalism as a theory of mind? Functionalism may result in attributing minds to complex systems that we otherwise would not consider to have minds. It might result in denying the presence of minds that operate according to different causal principles than our own. Indeed, Hilary Putnam, 1926, himself later rejected functionalism on the grounds 
that beliefs could not be computational states because their content was determined by external facts. And beliefs were also part of a whole system of knowledge. At the same time as Paul Kripke, 1940, and Keith Donnellan, 1931. He developed a new causal or direct theory of meaning, which was published in The Meaning of Meaning, 1975. Who was Alan Matheson Turing? Alan Matheson Turing, 1912-1954 Was a British cryptologist and mathematician who is credited with founding modern computer science. His Turing machine, which was an extensive thought experiment, formalized the concepts of algorithms and computation. The Turing machine consists of a possibly infinite paper tape with a stream of binary symbols that is continually scanned by a read-write device moving left or right and erasing or writing symbols on the tape, according to a program. Turing showed that any such machine could be programmed to simulate any other one. Meaning that it was a universal machine. This universal machine could implement every known mathematical method. He extended this model to machines that cannot be simulated by a universal Turing machine. Called Oracle Machines. Turing proposed that intellectual activity can be understood as networks of universal and Non-universal machines that can learn, through training, to become something like universal machines. After the invention of actual electronic computers, Turing suggested that theories of artificial intelligence could be tested. If there were a computer that could perform the same calculations as a human being to the point where a human being could not tell whether the results were produced by the computer or by another human being then there could theoretically exist artificial intelligence. Turing's 1950 article in Mind, Can Machines Think? continues to be highly influential in philosophy of mind discussions. In part as a result of John Searle's, 1932, treatment of it. For what is Lou Cyrigari most famous? The publication of Ira Gray's, 1932, doctoral thesis, Speculum of the Other Woman. 1974, led to her expulsion from further study at Lakin's Freudian School at Vincennes. In Europe a PhD is not sufficient for university teaching. As it is in the United States, and a second dissertation or habilitation is required. Ira Gary's dissertation consisted of her theoretical analyses of a lecture by Sigmund Freud. 1856 to 1939, on femininity and long quotations from the works of male philosophers, from Plato. C 428 C 348 BCE, to Hegel. 1770 to 1831. It was evident in the work that by a speculum, she was referring to the concave mirrored medical instrument inserted into a woman's body.
Who is Lucy Rigoray? Lucy Rigoray, 1932, was born in Belgium and attended Jacques Lacan psychoanalytic seminars in the 1960s. She is famous for having written, Sexual difference is probably the issue in our time which could be our salvation if we thought it through, and one must assume the feminine role deliberately. Which means already to convert a form of subordination into an affirmation, and thus to thwart it. Ira Gray's main writings include An Ethics of Sexual Difference. 1982, and J.E. 2, News, Toward a Culture of Difference, 1990. How is Confucianism relevant to contemporary Western philosophy? Confucianism is conservative and does not appear to be based on individual autonomy or self-rule. Its highest moral principle seems to be social conformity. To this extent it is not easily imported into Western moral, political, and social philosophy. However, a number of contemporary moral philosophers have found some Appeal in the Confucian egalitarian ideal of respect for all beings. Confucianism has also been received as an alternative virtue ethics theory. As well as for its utilitarian slash consequentialist notion that correct behavior will maximize happiness. Such comparative ideas, as well as contemporary interpretations and applications of Confucianism, can be found in the following sources, Bo Mao, Comparative Approaches to Chinese Philosophy, 2003. Li Shang Lisa Rosenley, Confucianism and Women, A Philosophical Interpretation, 2006, Philip J. Ivanhoe, Ethics in the Confucian Tradition, The Thought of Menzi and Wang Yangming, 2002, Brian W. Van Norden, Confucius and the Analects, New Essays, 2002, and Kuang Loi Shun and David B. Wang, Confucian Ethics, A Comparative Study of Self, Autonomy and Community, 2004. What does Afrocentrism have to do with philosophy? African philosophy is of interest to philosophers as a theoretical system of thought. Also, some philosophers have accepted the challenge raised by Afrocentrism. That Western philosophy has excluded the intellectual perspectives of Africans. What is the school of thought of Buddhism? The general structure of Buddhism as a school of thought is based on a religious belief in reincarnation, which is known as the will of life. The spiritual ideal is for the individual to stop being reincarnated. By adopting behavior with the correct karma, or consequences, the will of life is propelled by the flame of desire. The main obstacle to enlightenment is thereby identified as desire. Desire for people, money, 
power, fame, objects, and anything else. By following the Eightfold Path, a practitioner will snuff out his or her flame of desire and no longer need to return to this earth. There are three precepts or self-evident truths, that all life is unhappy or unsatisfying. That all life is impermanent, and that there is no eternal or even permanent self or soul. From these precepts, the Eightfold Path manifests itself, right speech, right action. Right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right views, and right intentions. What is Julia Kristeva's idea of the object and the nature of women? Kristeva has emphasized the rejection of mothers by both male and female. Children due to male-dominated cultural patterns that render the mother herself abject. Which is to say, totally other, disgusting, and monstrous. Kristeva thinks that the solution to this problem requires a rediscovery and healing of narcissism in women's psyches and an acceptance of adult love between women. However, Chris Tava rejects the label woman as a universal term, and has refused to define women. She apparently believes that every woman is fundamentally different in how she is a woman or what being a woman means. As she wrote, it is there, in the analysis of her difficult relation to her mother and to her own difference from everybody else. Men and women, that a woman encounters the enigma of the feminine. I favor an understanding of femininity that would have as many feminines as there are women. Christopher's main theoretical writings are, about Chinese women, 1977, Desire in Language. A Semiotic Approach to Literature and Art, 1980, Powers of Horror, An Essay on Abjection. 1982, Revolution in Poetic Language, 1984, and New Maladies of the Soul, 1995. Is there or has there been an African philosophy? There is a millennially long tradition of oral African philosophy. As well as many active 20th century African philosophers. Once this thought is presented in established Western philosophical terms, However, it does not so much support Afrocentrism as a perspective of racial uplift as it evinces a philosophy by asking questions about its own philosophical enterprise. That is, a great deal of contemporary African philosophy is itself concerned with the question of whether it is philosophy and what that means in an African, although not Afrocentrist, context. The context is not Afrocentrist because Africans who remained in Africa and were not brought to Europe or the Americas had no need for the distinctive uplift of Afrocentrism. Instead, the focus on Africa from an African perspective turns on the question of what the multiplicity of countries and cultures in Africa, each with distinct languages and traditions, have in common so that they can view themselves as African. 
they share a colonized past and poverty in the present world. They have been designated by biological race, though this is an illusion. Contemporary philosophical sources for African philosophy include Kwame Anthony Appiah. In My Father's House, Africa in the Philosophy of Culture, 1992, Kwame Geik, Tradition and Modernity. 1997, Emanuelis, Editor, Postcolonial African Philosophy, 1970, Paul and J. Houtanji, African Philosophy, Myth and Reality, 1983, John Biddy, African Religions and Philosophy. 1970, Albert Mosley, Editor, African Philosophy, Selected Readings, 1995, H. Adira Orica, Editor, Sage Philosophy, 1990, Burhan, Editor. African Philosophy, the Essential Readings, 1991, Kwasi Wiredu, Editor, A Companion to African Philosophy. 2004, and Richard Wright, Editor, African Philosophy, An Introduction, 1984. Who is Julia Kristeva? Since arriving in France in 1966 from Bulgaria, Julia Kristeva, 1941, has achieved international recognition for her writings about women in the psychoanalytic tradition. Her work is considered multidisciplinary, encompassing art criticism, philosophy, and cultural critique. Kristeva's primary theoretical contribution has been a distinction between the symbolic aspects of language and what she calls the semiotic. A psychic level of meaning based on a child's relationship to its mother. Primary human desires are attached to the semiotic, which is based on the biological rhythms of the maternal body. Although the semiotic eludes symbolic translation, What is the Tao? The Tao, or Way, advocated by Confucius involves appropriately performing one's roles in the family and society according to Jen, or loving respect for others. All are presumed to be equal in acting according to Jen. And if all act in this manner, the whole of society and the world will be improved. What was Confucius' influence? Confucius was the most highly regarded teacher, moralist, and poet in Chinese history. Mencius, 372-289 BCE, the most prominent Confucian philosopher after Confucius himself, held that all human beings are born with moral inclinations. Mencius' teachings have persisted as the dominant form of Confucianism to the present time. Sunzi C. 312-230 BCE taught Confucianism as a way of following formal hierarchical social structures to achieve personal happiness. For additional information on the teachings and history of Confucianism refer to 
Xin Songyao and HSIN Changyao, An Introduction to Confucianism, 2000. And Chengying Chen, New Dimensions of Confucian and Neo Confucian Philosophy, 1991. What is eliminative materialism? Eliminative materialism is the doctrine, first proposed by Paul Fireabend. 1974 to 1994, in the early 1960s, that science will eventually make it possible to eliminate all customary talk that presupposes non-material minds in favor of references to brain states only. The Canadian-born American philosopher Paul Chichland, 1942, and his wife. Patricia Chichland, 1943, have developed this view into a distinct branch of philosophy of mind. The Chichlands have held that our ordinary common sense theory of mind consisting of intentions, desires, and motives is mere folk psychology, which, like other folk beliefs, ought to be put aside in intellectual and scientific endeavors. Chichland wrote, Eliminative materialism is the thesis that our common sense conception of psychological phenomena constitutes a radically false theory. A theory so fundamentally defective that both the principles and the ontology of that theory will eventually be displaced. Rather than smoothly reduced, by completed neuroscience. Principal publications by Paul Chichland include Scientific Realism and the Plasticity of Mind, 1979. Eliminative Materialism and the Propositional Attitudes, published in the Journal of Philosophy in 1981. And The Engine of Reason, The Seat of the Soul, 1996, both Paul and Patricia penned on the contrary, 1998. Why has there been a third wave in feminism? According to its critics, the second wave was presumed to speak for all women while it merely propounded the interests of a small group of white, privileged American intellectual women. How have second-wave feminists addressed gender? They have criticized the social norm of compulsive heterosexuality. On the grounds that the human sex gender system is a system of power that benefits men at the expense of women. Some of this work has consisted of the deconstruction of gender as natural and a valorization of love between women. Judith Butler, the professor of rhetoric and comparative literature at the University of California at Berkeley, has challenged heteronormativity in Antigone's claim, kinship between life and death. 2000, and Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity, 1999. Butler is famous for her deconstruction of gender into performances of gender. Sarah Lucia Hoagland, in Lesbian Ethics, Toward a New Value, 1988, and Marilyn Fry in The Politics of Reality. Essays in Feminist Theory, 1983, developed foundational views of this perspective.
Who is Helen Success? Helen Success, 1937, is best known to philosophers for her The Laugh of the Medusa and Sorties, both 1975. These works constitute an anti-essentialist exhortation for women to reclaim their bodily experience in a new form of feminine writing, a creature feminine. Success has been interpreted to advocate bisexuality and multiplicities of sexuality in ways believed to have prefigured queer theory. What is the causal theory of meaning? This theory was first developed by Paul Kripke, 1940. Keith Donnellan, 1931, and Hilary Putnam, 1926, in the 1970s. There used to be a distinction between denotative and connotative. Or intentional, with an S, which is different from intention with a T, meaning. Denotative meaning was the thing or types of things in the world to which a word referred. Connotative or intentional meaning was the conditions of application of a word or the definition of the word in other words. According to the causal theory of meaning, also known as the causal theory of reference, there is a causal history that makes proper names the names of the individuals they are, something like a baptism. Natural kind terms, such as water and gold, work in much the same way. To take an example, the term water designates the natural H2O. If a substance were called water that was not H2O it would not be water. Putnam famously said of meanings in this regard that they just ain't in the head. Articles by Kripke, Donnellan, and Putnam on this subject appear in Naming. Necessity and Natural Kinds, 1977, edited by Stephen P. Schwartz. What is Confucianism? Confucius, 551 to 479 B. C. was born in Shantung, China, where he advanced from poverty to an influential administrative post. He was a member of the Jew. The literal meaning of Jew is weaklings, a social group of ritualists and teachers. Confucius and his colleagues and followers became members of the Jew Chia, the school of the Jew. They sought to develop and restore traditional ideals of concern for all living things and reverence toward other human beings by determining and following proper rules of conduct. In 496 Confucius left his position to talk to rulers about the Jew Chia's doctrines. During a time when warlords were chaotically vying for control of the declining Zhou dynasty, he sought to import moral principles and the traditional virtues into government. Confucius' thoughts were put together by his pupils in the Lunyu, or Analects. What are Afrocentrism and the African diaspora?
In the United States, Afrocentrism begins with the premise that American slaves end. Through intergenerational cultural inheritance if not a now untenable biological essentialism their descendants, came from Africa. At the time when the original slave populations were kidnapped from Africa. Africa had fully developed religions, cultures, cities, and civilizations dating before ancient Western philosophy. The involuntary implantations of Africans, as slaves. In the Americas and Europe resulted in a forced scattering, or diaspora, from those African origins. The reclamation of their African heritage on the part of African Americans results in a different perspective than the dominant white view that African slaves were forced. Immigrants without original cultures comparable to the cultures of those who enslaved them. Afrocentrism is thus a foundation for a new African American pride, in both origins and contemporary identity. Through cultural inheritance, for all groups and their members who are part of the African diaspora. A new legitimate foundation of culture, complete with its own art, architecture, poetry, styles of clothing, food, and everyday habits, is therefore claimed. It needs to be emphasized that this is in contrast to the culture of slave cabins, slave field labor, or slave service in the homes of masters, complete with the loss of original names. On through the oppressively degrading conditions of segregation, disproportionate incarceration, ghetto living conditions, the destruction of traditional black nuclear families and neighborhoods, and a general sense of being both the cause and object of America's unique race problem. Afrocentrism is thereby a perspective of encouragement and racial uplift. Sources on Afrocentrism include Martin Bernal's Black Athena. The Afroasiatic Roots of Classical Civilization, 3 Volumes, 1987-2006, Louis R. Gordon's Her Majesty's Other Children, Sketches of Racism from a Neocolonial Age. 1997, and Molify Asante's The Afrocentric Idea, 1987. How have Japanese, Chinese, and Indian philosophy recently entered Anglo-American philosophy? Asian philosophy came to the West as Buddhism from Japanese. Chinese and Indian philosophy, and Neo-Confucianism from Chinese philosophy. Given the common thread of Buddhism throughout Asia, many might be tempted to designate all philosophy from Japan, China, and India as Asian philosophy or Eastern philosophy. But there are other systems of thought and religion just as diverse as Buddhist traditions. Also, the different Buddhist traditions derive from cultures that have very distinctive histories. As well as very different current political and economic situations and ties to the West. That their theological dimensions are not Christian, Jewish, or Muslim is probably all that the philosophies of these areas broadly understood to be more than Buddhism and Confucianism have in common. Although Euro-American intellectuals in other fields have well developed scholarly traditions based on Eastern texts, it should be noted that philosophers 
as a profession, are relative latecomers to Eastern philosophy. For instance, the British biochemist Joseph Needham, 1900-1995, wrote extensively on technology. And science in the history of China, the 19th century German novelist Hermann Hesse. Introduced an international readership to Indian thought and Buddhism in his 1922 novel. Siddhartha, and philosophy's own Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, was fascinated by Chinese thought. The question is what do philosophers put on their curricula from Eastern? Thought in new ways that emphasize a commonality of philosophical interests? Again, the answer is Buddhism, on account of its resonance with Western metaphysics and epistemology. And Confucianism for what it teaches about virtue ethics. Is French feminism flamboyant? At times, yes, it is. For example, Verena Andermatt Conley relates that Helen Sixus, 1937, used to enter the complex of the University of Paris at Vincennes in a dazzling ermine coat, whose capital worth most probably surpassed the means of many in the classroom. Why are LBGT studies and queer theory part of philosophy now? They have become part of philosophy along with an overall interest in expanding cultural studies to include attention to issues previously neglected. This change has been part of the humanities, generally. And philosophers have focused on conceptual issues related to these fields. Queer theory emerged in the 1990s, along with LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual studies, as a positive affirmation of sexual difference that does not fit into any of its predecessor categories, including lesbianism. Good overviews on the subject may be found in Naomi Shore's Feminism Meets Queer Theory. 1997, and helpful works on transsexuality are Susan Stryker's Transgender History. 2008, and Laurie Shoreditch's You've Changed, 2009. Was Lucyra Gray's Speculum of the Other Woman socially relevant? Yes, and it has also had a tremendous influence on students and scholars of French feminist philosophy. In the context of the women's health movement in the United States during the 1970s, it expressed part of the spirit of the gynecological aspect of women's liberation. Women began to rebel about the fact that there were so few women doctors and that Male doctors treated their reproductive and childbirth issues in repressive ways. Women began to talk more openly about their feelings of shame about their own bodies. Members of some women's collectives began giving themselves and their friends gynecological examinations. And others, without prior medical training, taught themselves how to administer abortions. 
At the same time, the practices of natural childbirth, childbirth without medication, and nursing, which until then had been the only resort for many poor women, were advocated for privileged women, for the health of both mothers and babies. These examples of women taking responsibility for their health were motivated both by an ideology of rebellion against patriarchy and the goal of improving women's health. Since the 1970s, feminist advocates have pointed out that clinical medicine has traditionally been based on the male body. Some diseases have different symptoms in men and women for example, heart disease. At this time, female doctors are commonplace, particularly in the practice of gynecology. And there is greater attention, overall, to women's health problems. Historical Information on the 1970s women's health movement can be found at CWLU Her Story Project. The online history of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union is at http colon slash slash www.cwluhrstory.com. What was Wilfred Seller's idea of functionalism? Wilfred Sellers, 1912-1989, introduced the concept in his 1956 paper, Empiricism and Philosophy of Mind. According to Sellers, there can be no mental foundations of knowledge such as sense data. And he also rejected the pragmatist's myth of the given. By the given, the pragmatists referred to that part of experience that is not influenced by the perceiver or thinker. Functionalism, as developed by Sellers, as well as Hilary Putnam, 1926. In his early writings, is the thesis that mental states can be defined by three things. What causes them, their effects on other mental states, and their effects on behavior. That is, mental states can be understood in terms of their functions. Which operate like the software of a computer. How do the Chichlins account for perceptions of meaning? Meaning is fixed by networks of association. Ultimately, meaning will be replaced by connectionist networks with activation along preferred vectors. Sameness of meaning is no more than a sameness of patterns. In the library of the future, there will be plugs for directly activating relevant brain states and patterns. Bypassing the need to transmit meanings via language as we now know it. What is Fodor's language of thought hypothesis? The language of thought and thinking, as a mental language, is a system of symbols in the brain. Its content are propositional attitudes such as, thinks that, desires that, intends that, believes that, hopes that, and so forth. Each attitude has a distinct computational relation to a representation. 
Computation is information processing based on syntax. As Fodor puts it, there is no computation without representation. Thus, having a belief is being in a computational relation to a representation, as is having a desire. Every primitive concept in thought has a neural symbol in the brain. The end result of this in behavior is that the representation that is a belief causes an individual to behave as if it were true. Whereas the representation that is a desire causes the individual to behave to make it true. What are the modules of the mind, according to Jerry Fodor? In his The Modularity of Mind, 1983, Fodor posits transducers, senses that connect us with the outside world. Input systems, and central systems. Input and central systems are distinguished by the fact that input systems are modular and central systems are not. Modules each have one kind of cognitive material, for example, the visual module. And their information is encapsulated so that they can work very quickly, although they are inaccessible to conscious introspection. One module can be destroyed without impairing the others, as in cases of aphasia. Besides the different sensory systems, language is a module. It should be noted that Fodor does not hesitate to compare his theory with the system of phrenology propounded by Franz Joseph Gall. 1758-1828 which is usually taken to be an example of early pseudoscience. The nonmodular central systems correspond to thinking and believing and have access to other contents of the mind. Unlike language, the nonmodular central system is not localized. What have Western philosophers recognized in Buddhism? Buddhist thought rejects ideas of substance or substances as entities that endure through time and change. Speculation about the eternity of the world, its infinity or the connections between the soul or mind and the body are not considered worthwhile. In the Theravada schools of thought, perceptual experience is believed to justify mind-independent entities. But we do not experience them directly. Some commentators hold that there are independent entities. Otherwise our inference from experience that they exist could not be justified. Furthermore, we do not control what we perceive. Which suggests that things exist outside of our perception. Others distinguish between reliable and unreliable sensory experience. Some Buddhists believe that both minds and bodies are collections of transitory perceptions. According to the Madhi Hamaka school, there can't be individual objects because everything is dependent on everything else. However, enlightenment can result in an awareness of an underlying reality behind or beyond this flux. The Yogacara branch of this school holds that because there are no minds, there is no one to see the truth and no way to discover it. Given the lack of substances, 
which would include minds, all that exist are mental states. Our lack of control over perception or the apparent. Objectivity of things is merely the effect of our own memories. It should be evident at this point that Buddhism has grappled with the same kinds of questions about what really exists as those that have held the attention of Western philosophers throughout history. One difference is that, with the exception of ancient Stoicism and Epicureanism, and perhaps contemporary Buddhism, Western philosophers do not have life practices directly linked to their intellectual beliefs. Useful sources for philosophical comparison include Masao Abe and Stephen Hine, Zen, and Comparative Studies. 1997, Dan Lusthaus, Buddhist Phenomenology, A Philosophical Investigation of Yogacara Buddhism. 1997, and Anil Kumar Sarkar, Buddhism and Whitehead's Process Philosophy, 1991. How did John Searle disagree with Alan Matheson Turing? The American philosopher John Searle, 1932, a professor at the University of California at Berkeley since 1959, has described his own work as an attempt to reconcile the world of science with the human self-conception of mindful animals with free will. In his Intentionality, an essay on the philosophy of mind, 1983, Searle argued that mental states are both caused by and realized in neurobiological brain processes. He called this view biological naturalism. In his Chinese Room argument, he attempted to refute a broad Turing-inspired strong artificial intelligence view that mind could be duplicated by the right computational device. Additional works by Searle, which advocate the non-reductionality of consciousness, while also acknowledging contemporary science. R. Expression and Meaning, Studies in the Theory of Speech Acts, 1979. The Rediscovery of the Mind, 1992, The Mystery of Consciousness, 1997, and Mind, A Brief Introduction, 2004. What is feminism and feminist philosophy? Feminism involves both thought and practice aimed at improving the well-being of women. On the side of practice it is often thought of as the women's movement. Intellectually, feminism is a critical theory because it contains analysis of social conditions and prescriptions for improving them toward its end. Also on the intellectual side, feminism is now a multidisciplinary academic field with participation from all of the humanities. Contemporary Cultural Criticism, the Social Sciences, and Women's Studies Feminist philosophy is the philosophical dimension of intellectual feminism. Many feminist philosophers understand their intellectual history and the history of the women's movement in terms of three waves. What is Catherine McKinnon's argument against pornography?
According to McKinnon, pornography not only exploits and objectifies those women who are its subjects, but it also expresses and supports the overall oppression of women in society. The subordinate status of women in pornography as well as the violence against women depicted in so many of its forms, is part of an unjust sex gender system. What was John Searle's Chinese room argument? In his The Rediscovery of the Mind, 1992, Searle supposed that a person who understands no Chinese is locked in a room with Chinese symbols and an algorithm or computer program that can be used to automatically answer questions in Chinese. The answers are good enough to be indistinguishable from answers by a Chinese speaker. Searle insists that what is missing from this picture, which is the overall computational theory of the mind in contemporary philosophy, is understanding the person in the room does not understand Chinese. Adherence to a computational theory of mind, in response to Searle's position would probably claim that unless we go back to a mysterious ghost in the machine the behavior of the person locked in the room is exactly what is meant by understanding Chinese. As to who is right in this argument, no one knows for sure. As Jerry Fodor, 1935, noted, we, meaning philosophers of mind, do not yet have an adequate theory of mind. If you think you do, then try explaining exactly how your desire to raise your right arm results in that arm going up. What is French feminism? French feminism is a school of thought named by feminists outside France to refer to work mainly proffered by Luce Iragaray. 1932, Helen Sixus, 1937, and Julia Kristeva, 1941. But none of these three is originally from France. And from time to time each has denied being a feminist. What Ira Gary, Sixus, and Chris Tava all share is that their work is based on considerations of philosophical and psychoanalytic texts. They all assume that to improve the situation of women, fundamental psychological structures need to be revised. That is, they are working within the tradition of structuralism. By comparison, there is another group of French feminists whose work is more sociological and activist than theoretical. Known as French materialist feminists, they address the situation of women by attempting to change society through political activism and work in the social sciences. Key figures are Simon de Beauvoir, 1908 to 1986, Christine Delphi, 1941, Monique Wittig, 1935 to 2003, and Colette Guillaume, 1934. Some of their theoretical work, which has been especially influential in the Communist Revolutionary League describes the ways in which the free labor of women in the family supports capitalism.
What is the story about Nigel and the spider? While Nagel was working in William James Hall at Harvard University one summer, he noticed a spider that lived in the men's urinal. Every time the urinal flushed, the poor arachnid would make a mad dash for its life so as not to drown. Nagel was concerned about what would happen to it when classes were in session and the urinal was flushed with greater frequency. After long and careful deliberation, Nagel decided to liberate the spider. He carefully removed it from the urinal with a paper towel and placed it in a corner of the room. At first the spider did not move, and Nagel assumed it was getting its bearings. He left town over a holiday weekend, and when he returned the poor spider had still not moved. It was quite dry and quite dead. Nagel recounts this episode in The View from Nowhere, 1986. His implication seems to be that even the greatest compassion and best intentions may miss their objective. Due to a lack of understanding of the circumstances of another. What is Fodor's surprising view of evolution? Fodor is by no flight of the imagination a creationist. However, he does not accept an evolutionary psychology account of human cognition without qualification. Consider what he wrote in 1998. Nothing is known about how the structure of our minds depends on the structure of our brains. Nobody even knows which brain structures it is that our cognitive capacities depend on. Unlike our minds, our brains are, by any gross measure, very like those of apes. So it looks as though relatively small alterations of brain structure must have produced very large behavioral discontinuities in the transition from the ancestral apes to us. If that's right, then you don't have to assume that cognitive complexity is shaped by the gradual action of Darwinian selection on prehuman behavioral phenotypes. In other words, Fodor claims that it might be unnecessary to posit specific environmental conditions or even a progression of adaptive changes in order to account for the complexity of the human mind. For all we know, one small mutation might have made all the important mental difference between apes and us. How did race become important in feminist philosophy? The complexity of feminist issues of race were underscored by University of California at Los Angeles law professor Kimber Cruz has groundbreaking paper Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine. Feminist Theory and Anti-Racist Politics, University of Chicago Legal Forum 139-67, 1989. Kimberla's work introduced the problems of intersectionality whereby oppressed ions due to race and gender can't simply be added because they result in distinctive new identities that form a situation of new forms of discrimination. K. 
Kimberla argued that black women are not protected by either discrimination. Laws for women or by discrimination laws for blacks white women take precedence over them in the first instance and black men in the second. That is, anti-discrimination laws are satisfied in the letter of the law by protecting groups of women in which white women dominate, and groups of blacks in which men dominate. The result is that black women are not legally protected as black women. How did race become important in feminist philosophy? The complexity of feminist issues of race were underscored by University of California at Los Angeles law professor Kimberla Cruzha's groundbreaking paper Demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex, a black feminist critique of anti-discrimination doctrine Feminist theory and anti-racist politics University of Chicago Legal Forum 139-67, 1989 Kimberla's work introduced the problems of intersectionality whereby oppress ions due to race and gender can't simply be added because they result in distinctive new identities that form a situation of new forms of discrimination. Kimberla argued that black women are not protected by either discrimination. Laws for women or by discrimination laws for blacks white women take precedence over them in the first instance and black men in the second. That is, anti-discrimination laws are satisfied in the letter of the law by protecting groups of women in which white women dominate, and groups of blacks in which men dominate. The result is that black women are not legally protected as black women. What is the problem caused by intersectionality? The result of all the intersectionalities has been a widely accepted equation that race plus class equals gender. Resulting in a multiplicity of women's genders that prevents the possibility of women working together or even identifying in the same way. And the result of that is an unspecified number of feminisms. Once different women's genders are recognized, it can be very difficult for them to reunite as women. For example in their essay Have We Got a Theory for You? 1998 Maria C. Lagones and Elizabeth V. Spellman use a dialogue to show how some differences in Angla and Latina cultural experience simply cannot be translated into each other's framework of understanding. What is the problem caused by intersectionality? The result of all the intersectionalities has been a widely accepted equation that race plus class equals gender. Resulting in a multiplicity of women's genders that prevents the possibility of women working together or even identifying in the same way. And the result of that is an unspecified number of feminisms. Once different women's genders are recognized, it can be very difficult for them to reunite as women.
for example in their essay Have We Got a Theory for You? 1998 Maria C. Lagones and Elizabeth V. Spellman use a dialogue to show how some differences in Angla and Latina cultural experience simply cannot be translated into each other's framework of understanding. Why is the unity or commonality of women important? Although the entire world knows which human beings are women and not men. If feminists cannot agree on this matter then it is not clear how feminism can advocate for the well-being of women. Third world, poor, and racially marginalized women need the support of first world women. Who in turn might learn from the practical forms of organizations developed in less advantaged countries and cultures. Without a perceived commonality among women, there is no basis on which common political ends, such as health care, education, child care for working mothers, and preservation and care of the natural environment, can be collectively pursued by feminists. Why is the unity or commonality of women important? Although the entire world knows which human beings are women and not men. If feminists cannot agree on this matter then it is not clear how feminism can advocate for the well-being of women. Third world, poor and racially marginalized women need the support of first world women who in turn might learn from the practical forms of organizations developed in less advantaged countries and cultures without a perceived commonality among women there is no basis on which common political ends such as health care education child care for working mothers and preservation and care of the natural environment, can be collectively pursued by feminists.